Hello Magic Community on YouTube, I'm T1 Glistenrolf. Recently I had a discussion, a debate, with another Magic the Gathering YouTuber and pro, or semi-pro, I think he's a pro player, we're gonna say pro, uh, Jeff Hoogland. Now, if you're like me, I was introduced to Jeff Hoogland through his playing Tron, actually. You might have seen another deck like Four Color Loam or anything else he might have played, uh, but I was introduced through his playing Tron. And so it was kind of cool to me that he and I were at one point discussing Blood Moon against Tron. Now, I think that that's actually a pretty good thing to talk about because it's complicated. It's not a black and white issue like, for example, Rest in Peace versus Dredge. That one's pretty clear. Blood Moon versus Tron is not. Now, I'd like to actually show you his uh, tweets in the, in the discussion we were having. Unfortunately, he ended up blocking me. Now, if I had been harassing him, that'd be a different story. But apparently this is something that he does with some frequency. Uh, blocking people on his stream or on social media uh, that have disagreements with him. And it's caused some flare-ups on said social media, on Reddit. Um, and so, I'm not... He's, now, he's still a good player. There, there's a reason you get to where you are. DSP was also a good player at one point, but he still whines about variants, or I guess in Street Fighter it would be lag. <laughs> And he talks about how the other person's maybe cheating, which Jeff does, talking about ghosting, or similar such things. And disagreeing with people in such a way that you can't stand that they said it and you block them. So, but that being the case, again, he's a good enough player, take his opinion for something. And so, I actually wanted to discuss why I say now, it's actually not even that we disagreed that much. We have pretty similar opinions on this. It's just that he and I draw the line in a different place. Let me, let me bring you Saffron Olive's take on it uh, from Twitter. He said, Blood Moon is good against Tron, but only if you have a fast clock. It's surprising how many people think that just a Blood Moon is game over against the deck. And tweak one word, we'll get to that in a second, and that's exactly what my opinion is, and that's basically what Jeff's is. And so there's actually not all that much daylight between where we are, but he and I draw the line in a different place on essentially how fast the clock has to be. That's essentially what the argument boils down to. Because, well actually let me, before, before I get further into it, let me give some context to make sure that we're all on the same page here. Why is Blood Moon a good card? I know that seems really obvious, but it's important to note this just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Blood Moon is good because it mana screws the opponent. If they're on some Esper list, whatever it may be, and you drop a Blood Moon and they don't have any basics, they may not be able to play anything for the rest of the game. Blood Moon doesn't advance your game plan, it disrupts the opponent's game plan. Blood Moon is this interesting card in that it has a dynamic, as far as I'm aware, pretty close to unique to it, where the worse your meta gets, the worse Blood Moon gets. Go to Friday Night Magic and play against people with these budget brews that have all of these basics in them, and Blood Moon does not do very much there at all. On the other hand, take Blood Moon to a Pro Tour when you see people playing all of these two-color, three-color, four-color decks, and suddenly Blood Moon gets a lot better. And that's, again, because Blood Moon mana screws the opponent. Theoretically, if you were on the play and your opponent's on the draw, and you got a Blood Moon and they could not cast anything for the rest of the game, you could win just on your opponent drawing themselves out. That's the kind of disruptive effect that Blood Moon is. <laughs> there aren't that many other cards in Magic that can boast that sort of thing. Again, this is magical Christmas land for trolls, but that is something that could happen. But that isn't the case for Tron, because Blood Moon mana screws them in a different way. See, of course, for those that don't know, Tron lands are Urza's Tower, Power Plant, and Mine. If you're watching this video, you probably know what those are, but just to make sure we're all together. Individually, they make one colorless mana each. Collectively, they tap for seven mana. And this is where the brokenness of Tron comes from. Being able to, for example, get a turn three worm coil engine or a Karn or something like that. Tron lands are really good. 
Now, Blood Moon, of course, will make them play like Fairlands, where they'll only ever generate one mana, even if you have Tron assembled. Urza's Tower is great. Urza's Mountain, not quite as much. However, because they generate colorless mana, that means that the payoff cards for Tron have to either be colorless or not have much colored mana in them. So, for example, again, your Wormcoil Engine, your Karn, your Ugans, something like Worldbreaker gets to be a little bit of an exception because it has one green in its cost. Those sorts of cards are, by necessity, the payoffs because they have to have colorless mana or generic mana. But, and this is key, because they can they have colorless cost. If you give the Tron player enough time, eventually they'll be able to get to the point where they can just hard cast them. Where a lot of Blood Moon pilots go wrong is actually in deck building. See, if you go up against that three or four color deck that you've just locked out of the game entirely, then yeah, you can take all the time in the world to find your threats. So you don't actually have to have that many threats, eventually you'll just get to them. But against Tron, as we just discussed, that's not true. If you dilly-dally for too long, they'll actually find enough lands and a payoff creature, or planeswalker or whatnot, and they'll get back in the game. In other words, if you wait on Tron, Tron doesn't wait on you. You have to close out the game in a reasonable amount of time. I don't think that you have to be fast, but you can't be slow. Now granted, Tron is a list that usually doesn't play that many lands. When I think of a, a hard control list, I'm thinking perhaps 26 lands. Jeskai Flash might have 26 lands in it. When I think of Tron, I think 19 or 20 or 21. Not that many, and the reason is because they have all these effects to go and get more lands. They have Expedition Map, they have Ancient Stirrings, which can also get a threat. They have Sylvan Scrying, which used to be able to get a threat because you could get Eye of Ugin, and then Eye of Ugin could go and get anything you want, rip Eye of Ugin. Two of those, of course, require that they have green mana, colored mana. And then Expedition Map, if they're going to Expedition Map for a basic to play around Blood Moon, because the deck doesn't typically run fetch lands, there may be some exceptions to that. Some red-green or black-green Tron list might run fetch lands, like Verdant Catacombs. But it, uh, if they're having to go and get a basic, that means they didn't get a Tron land, which means you might have time-walked them anyway unless they naturally had it in hand. The point that I'm making is that you have to close the game out at some point at a, in a reasonable amount of time before the opponent can eventually just get to either a payoff card naturally, like Worm Coil Engine, or one of the ways out. And so I'll get to that in just a second. Now it's important to note that where we draw the line at fast might be different. That might be where a lot of the, the heat between the two of us uh, heat, that's not the right word, but that may be where the disagreement is coming from. So, for example, I think we can all agree that Glistener Elf killing you on the second turn of the game with a bunch of mutagenic growths is a pretty fast kill. That's pretty obvious. On the other hand, do we consider turn 4 Nahiri Imrakul on turn 6? Do we consider that to be fast? Well, under normal circumstances, no. We, we wouldn't. Because that's, again, turn four before you even get the Nahiri out, and a lot of other decks have already beaten you to the ground before then. On the other hand, if you have a Blood Moon out, is that fast? I would argue that it is. Uh, someone like Jeff might argue that that is not, and that might be where the disagreement's coming from. Which is perfectly fair. I argue that it's fast because Blood Moon is hampering their ability to make lots of mana, and the deck typically doesn't run that many lands. And thus, yeah, it's one thing if they we just naturally play a land every turn, that may not happen when Blood Moon has done its work. So I, I consider that to be fast in the context of Blood Moon. Uh, another example is we have Jace the Mind Sculptor de uh, decks. So Blue Moon might run Jace the Mind Sculptor. Is Jace the Mind Sculptor fate sealing you fast? Probably not. It, Tron has a, ter has a weakness to Fate Sealing that a lot of other decks don't have. Well, I, okay, no, a lot of decks get Fate Sealed hard, but Tron gets Fate Sealed really hard. And I can go more into that in just a second. Um, I should note some exceptions, though. Now, number one, and the most important one, is Oblivion Stone. 
Oblivion Stone is the main out that Tron decks have, and they're usually running at least three, often four. Uh, this is part of why. If they get locked under a Blood Moon, if they can get to five lands, eventually they'll be able to crack the Oblivion Stone, and then they're often golden past that point. So Oblivion Stone is important to note. Now, if they're running four, that means that by the time they get to turn three, I think it's about a coin toss to have at least one in hand. So if you're the Blood Moon deck, maybe every other game expect to see that. Uh, another thing I should note is that they do often have colored mana in the form of basics, like Basic Forest, for instance. Forest can go and get Ancient st or cast Ancient Stirring, which can find them in Oblivion Stone, or a another land to help keep curving out. And so yes, they can, even with a Blood Moon, still use colored mana. Uh, I should note that there are also mana rocks. You don't see as many signets as you used to, of course, but Chromatic Sphere and Chromatic Star do give them colored mana for, again, something like Ancient Stirvings or Stirrings or Sylvan Scrying, or simply to help them draw into a Naturalize effect. Now, it's important to note, though, that even if they have the colored mana, they're not making degenerate amounts of mana, and so you might still be fine. Essentially, to sum up this side of the argument, it's where I draw the line at fast is different if there is a Blood Moon in play, and that seems to be the disagreement that he and I have. For example, I said that Blood Moon uh, is... Blood Moon in the context of Blue Moon is good against Tron. And he disagreed with me. Now, let's ignore Jace the Mind Sculptor. Well, actually, let's not first, but we'll, we'll get to ignoring Jace the Mind Sculptor. Because Tron has so many fluff cards, as is true for a lot of ramp decks, if you can deal with the few actual powerhouses they have, then there is the chance that the Tron player will just draw, not find something they can use, draw, not find something they can use, and so on and so forth. The grass is always greener on the other side. We may not see it if we're not Tron players, but Tron players are intimately aware of this, where you might open Karn Liberated Worm Coil Engine, and if your opponent happens to deal with those, you might be sitting back for a bit waiting to find something. It may not be the most frequent thing in the world, but it is real, and especially under a Blood Moon. So that what my point here is that if Jace Fate seals you, he can take what few non-fluff cards you have and put them on the bottom. And that makes it especially hard. Fate sealing is hard for any deck to deal with, but especially hard for Tron if they don't already have cards in hand. Now, be, ignoring Jace, ignoring Jace, a Blue Moon deck might have something like Through the Breach, Emrakul for a fast kill. But I think that we're all in agreement that that counts. Blue Moon is a little bit weird because it's a counterspell Blood Moon deck. Mana Leak is historically a bad card against Blood uh, against Trine Lands for obvious reasons. They're going to make so much mana that eventually Mana Leak doesn't do very much. You might get a turn out of it. It's too slow to stop their setup spells like Expedition Map, Ancient Stirrings, maybe Sylvan Scrying, but it's also too weak to deal with their payoff cards by the time that they have 10 mana, for instance. You might hit the Karn Liberated on turn 3 if they didn't wait. But that's, that's not much. But with Blood Moon out, the opposite is true. It's pretty much always live because of how expensive their big payoff cards are. If they're having to naturally, slowly assemble that many lands, Mana Leak is really strong against them. Remand is also, well, Remand is Remand. You're, you're going to give them that back. Uh, Cryptic Command is something that there's not much they can do with. Ceremonious Rejection's in your sideboard, and the Gate's probably in your sideboard. And so you're not... I, I do honestly believe that Blue Moon decks, especially now that they have Jace, are better against Tron, and are maybe even favored against Tron. I, I do on I know no are favored. By how much I think we can disagree, and I'm open to being wrong, but based on what I've told you, if they have Blood Moon, I think that they're in a favored position in that match. Okay, and then there are other Blood Moon decks. Um, it's important that Jeff notes that Ponza is a Blood Moon deck that feels very different. And that's true, there's something to that. Uh, Ponza decks don't just have Blood Moon, they have land destruction effects, which keep them from ever developing to that state in the game. There's not even really much of a chance for them to do that. You know, turn one Arbor Elf, turn two Utopia Sprawl, Arbor Elf, make four mana, Bloodbraid into Stone Rain. 
Like, what are you even supposed to do as a Tron player? What are you even supposed to do? But okay, so that's an important distinction. It's a Blood Moon deck that sort of defies this whole argument altogether. In short, in summary, I actually don't think that Jeff's ultimately wrong. If his characterization of my argument is Herp Derp Blood Moon equals free win, then of course he's right. You, Blood Moon does not automatically mean that your opponent needs to sign their match slip right then. That's, that's not how it works. Play it out because they can get out. But is Blood Moon good against Tron? Yeah! Yeah, it really is! The point that you have to have a clock is, of course, completely correct. Where we draw the line at what constitutes a fast clock is essentially the crux of the disagreement between the two of us. Now, he may not be the most diplomatic person, but you don't get to where you are by being 100% wrong all of the time. Of course there's some merit to what he's saying. Of course there is. Alright, so that's it. Take care, Magic Community. I will see you later. Bye-bye!